ladies and gentlemen, now hosting the Rizzo cast, put your hands together for Steven Rizzoto. All right, and we are back with another, and I should say another legendary baseball fan. This is Chris Corbett, and he is from Toronto, and he joins uh, Why I Love the Game. Chris, how you doing? Welcome. I'm good, Stephen. How are you doing, bud? Thanks for having me. This has been a long time coming. I know we've talked about doing this for a while now. I'm glad I can finally find the time to join you. Yeah, this is going to be awesome, and and I know that you have a very extensive baseball story, and I'm I'm glad you're you're on the show um i i guess first and foremost uh i mentioned toronto so you are a canadian baseball fan um how did you kind of get into baseball and and where does where does your allegiance lie i think i could guess i think i know but you know (laughs) yeah um um, you know uh most listeners won't you know hearing i'm from toronto um i can't really pinpoint exact time you know it was the er, mid to early 80s you know, down at the old exhibition stadium, watching the Jays play. You know, the earliest memory I have was uh, a game that we had up here called the Pearson Cup, I believe it was. Every year, the Jays at Expos played a exhibition game. And the earliest memory I have of that game was when Pete Rose played for the Expos. I remember going to the game with, I believe it was my grandmother. And uh, she hated Pete Rose. And I was like, oh, he's, you know, he's a pretty good hitter. You know, and just those early days of the early Blue Jays teams, you know, Bell, Barfield, Mosby in the outfield, um, as they were known, the Killer Bees, you know, Dave Steve on the mound and his wicked slider, Jimmy Key, you know, just just the ambiance of just being around the game and watching the game live was just, and the crowd interaction and everybody getting into it. It just, you know, it amazed me at such a young age and I've loved it ever since. And, you know, kind of being around there during the early days of, in baseball in Toronto uh, and in, in Canada, actually, uh, and the Expos were there, too, of course. Did Do you think uh, Canada kind of, like, got attached to baseball right away, or did it take some time? Because I know that there are a lot of baseball fans in Canada, but did it take some time for it to be like that? I, I think with, like, everything else, everything else in sports, I think it took the team to winning you know, before the team started winning a little bit for te- for fans to really get into it. You know, the first few years from 77 to 81, 82 were pretty rough. And then 83, 84, they were improving. 85, they were the American League East champions. And, you know, that, that got some excitement in. And then 86, nothing. 87, the epic collapse where they were only a few games up with a few games go to left to go in the season and you know Tony Fernandez busted his elbow and Detroit ended up coming back and winning the division and you know the rest is history and then finally winning the World Series in 92 and 93 but I think with everything it just took you know winning and Toronto sports fans are hungry for a winner here because up until 1992, aside from the Argos, which I don't even know if a lot of people like, not everybody in Canada gets behind, but we had to have a major championship in Toronto before 92. In 1967 is when the Leafs last won the Stanley Cup. So they were hungry for a winner. And they got a little bit, a, a little taste of it in the mid 80s and ultimately in 92 and 93. Are the Raptors big there? Like, is it a big basketball like city, big basketball area? Because we know hockey. I mean, obviously hockey yep. and and uh, Canada kind of go hand in hand. But I guess basketball and football. Does Canada like keep a close eye on it? I mean, they got the team right there. They don't have an NFL team. But uh, what what's the the uh, the turnout like for those two other sports? Football, not so much. We, you know, we have the CFL up here. I don't really hear a lot about it like I do. I hear more about the NFL here than I do the CFL. But the Raptors, I wasn't sure how they were perceived until 2019 when they won the NBA championship. And it was just like seeing the pictures and the videos of people partying after the game. And then the parade was like, wow, this this is a basketball city. This is like they're, they they love their basketball here. And it makes sense because, you know, it's a, a lot of younger people 
are more into basketball, right? Like not the older generation, but like they were just, the city was crazy. I, it made the Blue Jay celebration in the early 90s look like a friendly get together. <laughs> a friendly get together. I like how you worded that. Um, and you're also a big Giants fan. Now, I am. from someone thousands of miles away, or I guess hundreds of thousands, I don't know how exactly it is, but from well, someone five or so, 600 miles, five or 600 miles, yeah, I did thousands and thousands. I don't know what I'm talking about, <laughs> but from someone so far away and, you know, Blue Jays for a long time, how did you kind of get involved with becoming a Giants fan? It all started on a specific date in 1992, December 7th or 8th to be exact. You know, I'm sure everybody listening to this podcast knows that date. The day I think or, I know day that Barry date Bond, too. Yeah, the day Barry Bonds signed. Yeah. You know, like he was somebody I seen in highlights and stuff when he was with Pittsburgh and that epic home run he hit where, you know, his hands went in the air while he was with the Pirates and leaning back. Yeah, like I was like, oh, I like this guy. And then, you know, I just followed him and followed him. I started to get more national broadcasts up here with us getting, you know, Atlanta channels, Chicago channels. So I started watching them more and I was like, this is the guy I'm going to attach myself to. And then watching him in the playoffs all those years with Pirates. And then when he left Pittsburgh, I was like, okay. And he signed with the Giants. So I'm like, all right, I'll, I'll follow them. And so, you know, the more I watched, the more I loved other players on the team. You know, a big Robbie Thompson fan, uh, Royce Clayton, Darren Lewis in center field, you know, Willie McGee. Didn't watch a lot of Will Clark a couple of years, you know, when he was there. Matt Williams, you know, and then the championship teams, you know, the devastating, heartbreaking team in 2002. And, you know, it was just, and then when Bonds was blackballed, I found myself drawn to Lincecum. You know, he, he was my replacement and it was just, you know, it's just grew and grew and grew. Does it help to have a team in both leagues? Cause I know a lot of fans do that where they have a national league team in the Bay area. You see it all the time where, uh, you know, there's the perceived rivalry that there's, you know, it's the giants versus the A's, you know, you got to pick a side, but there's a lot of fans that I know that are just Bay area sports fans and they like the A's in the American league and they like the giants in the national league. And you like the blue Jays in the American league and the giants in the national league. So does it help to kind of like, um, yeah, a team from both leagues. So, you know, your rooting pattern doesn't really get mixed up. I know that's going to change coming up here with this new schedule and the giants are going to be seeing a little more of the Jays and you're going to be seeing a little bit more of the giants in Toronto at times. Yeah. So does it help to have those two rooting, I guess, changes and not changes, but those two rooting um, factors in both leagues in each league. It definitely does because, you know, it gives the intrigue of, you know, what happens if they meet in the World Series? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like I, I've been asked, you know, since 93, what happens if the Giants and Blue Jays meet in the World Series? Who are you cheering for? That's easy. I live in Toronto. I'm cheering for the Giants. Like, you know, the, the Giants are my favorite team. The Blue Jays are secondary, you know, mostly because I live here. But, you know, and I've been here all my life, but I am a bigger Giants fan than the Blue Jays fan. So much so that I got a Giants logo tattooed on my right calf after the Giants won the World Series in 2012. So, yeah, people can't question you. They, they can't question no. where your allegiance is because of that. I, that. I did not know about that tattoo, Chris. Yes. Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. So here's a, here's a funny story. In 2001, when Barry Bonds was breaking the all-time home run record, I was wearing a Bonds jersey at work. And a guy came up to me, he's like, are you only wearing the Bonds jersey because of his record? And I said, no, I am a Giants fan. I'm a Bonds fan as long as I can remember. Wearing a Giants jersey 11 years or nine years later, same guy. Are you only wearing a Giants jersey because they won the World Series? I said, are you going to ask me this every 10 years when somebody on the Giants is doing something? I said, remember? He's like, oh, that's right. I forgot. <laughs> so, you know, like I, I have questions. Like, I get questioned all the time about it. I've argued with some friends. Oh, you have to cheer for the Blue Jays. They're your, favorite. They're your home team. They like other teams in different sports. And I'd say to one of my friend, friends who is a Detroit Red Wings fan, if the Red Wings are playing the Leafs in the Stanley Cup, who are you cheering for? I know it's not the Leafs, so don't, don't tell me. Yeah, exactly. Can't question Chris at all. No. Um, 
Now, tell me a little bit about uh, what you were doing when the Jays, you know, won those championships in the early 90s. I mean, such a big moment. We always think of the signature Joe Carter home run uh, and touch them all, Joe. You'll never hit a bigger home run in your life. I mean, what was that euphoria like for you and I guess for the city? You kind of touched on it a little bit, but for you personally. It was just like, you know, every, you know, the old childhood dream everybody has hitting a walk off home run and never actually seeing one live. You know, it was the only, it's still the only walk off World Series walk off, World Series winning home run in World Series history with a team behind. Bill Mazeroski right. hit one, but it was tied. But Joe Carter's hit, he hit his when his team was losing. It was just like craziness. I was watching the game with my cousins. He hit the ball. We didn't even see it go out. We ran outside and was like, wait a minute, it might have went foul. Ran back inside to see everybody going crazy and we're like, it went fair. And we proceeded to head downtown with our buddies and just, you know, walk around downtown, high-fiving people and just like celebrating. It, it was fun. And that's the funny thing is, is that's when the whole, you know, act like you've been there before type thing goes out the window. Cause Joe Carter oh, like was like a little kid and it was so cool to see him, you know, now on replay, I was not alive of course, but seeing him jumping up and down and, and touching home plate, was that your favorite baseball moment? Or do you have another favorite baseball moment that kind of sticks out? Um, That, that would be up there because, you know, it's just because it's not something you see every year, you know, like you'll get, you'll get the special October moments, like the David freeze from 2011 with St. Louis against Texas. But Personally, my favorite moment as far as being there in person, I was there in 2015 when Jose, B Jose Bautista hit that epic home run off of Sam Dyson and the Texas Rangers and that epic bat flip that caused so much issues between him and the Rangers. I was actually at that game live. My wife decided that morning, she's like, I wouldn't mind going to game five. So I looked up tickets, found them cheap enough, and we ended up going special chance to go to a deciding game and we ended up seeing one insanely crazy seventh inning that was capped off by one of the most famous bat flips ever yeah and when when you go to, and i've been at a few games i've been lucky enough to go to a few games where the crowd is loud enough and something happens to where the whole place buzzes and i'm sure it buzzed in that moment and and you know looking there, there's some things when you're at those live games that you miss and then you see later on because it was so euphoric that you miss it in the moment. Did you see the bat flip at that time or did you have to go back and like watch, you know, on Twitter or something and God, that bat flip was huge or, or did you see it in the moment? No, I, I seen it afterwards. I was, I was too busy watching the ball go over the yeah. left field <laughs> fence. And then, you know, in between innings, the stadium was still buzzing. Like it was vibrating. Like it was just so loud and everything. It's inside. So I too. went on Twitter and I <laughs> and I was like, "Oh my god!" He almost threw the the bat as far as the ball went. Like it was just pure insanity. Um, we we see a clip up here a lot of Cole Hamill sitting in the dugout, and it looks like somebody is like it looks like an earthquake because you can see the camera shaking so bad from the crowd just going insane. Like it was just, I'll, I'll never forget that. That is wild. And and I, I would be uh I would be disappointed if I didn't ask you your favorite Giants moment. Do you have one? A lot that you pick from the buffet, Chris. <laughs> oh yeah. Um my favorite moment. It's a toss-up. You know, I I want to say the Bonds, you know, 2001 chase to him chasing Hank Aaron's record. But I think my favorite moment comes from 2010. And game one of the NLDS, Tin Lincecum against Atlanta. That game is just insanity. I, I think I've watched that game at least 20 times. Yeah, that was the first baseball game I ever watched, too. That was it. it that was, was number just... one for me. That was what made me a baseball fan. Game one, uh, complete game, 14 strikeouts, two hits. He was dominant and, like, Everybody was talking about Roy Halladay throwing the no-hitter. That was the game. That was the dominant game of of that two-day span or whatever it was. It might have been the same night, or was it the night I think before? It, I think it was the same day. I believe it was the same day. And Lincecum's had a higher Bill James uh, game yes. score than Halladay. Yep. So yep. shout out to, uh, and obviously rest in peace, Roy Halladay. But Lincecum, Lincecum had that night for sure. 
Um, do you, do you have a favorite? This is kind of a, a toss up. There's going to be two toss ups here where you could kind of get creative with this. Do you have a favorite baseball movie that you like? I know I've heard the answers, Bull Durham, Major League, Sandlot. What do you like to uh, go back and watch every once in a while? Um, of the mainstream movies, Field of Dreams. I love it. It's just, I don't know, there's something about it. But there's a movie nobody ever talks about. And I'm sure I've discussed it with you in the past. Sugar. Yes. Yes, it's about, you know, a kid from the Dominican. And, you know, it kind of shows us on the outside looking in what these players from down there go through, you know, and how, you know, just because they have the talent, they have to struggle the mental side. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just, it, it was a very, very good movie. You know, it's not talked about enough whenever anybody does their top tens or top fives for baseball movies. It, it's, you know, it, it's one of my favorites. Yeah, I don't think we realize enough how difficult it is to come from a different country where no English is spoken. Um, so 100% Sugar is a good movie for sure. Um, what about when you're at the ballpark? Do you have like a favorite meal that you get, favorite food? Uh, I know in the Bay Area, a lot of Giants fans have said garlic fries. I guess what is in Toronto or if you're going to a baseball baseball game, what are you getting to eat? You know, this stereotypical hot dog and beer, yeah. <laughs> you know, like in Toronto, actually, I never made it out this year, but uh, Toonie or Tuesdays were uh, dollar hot dog night. Wow. And Yeah. And every Wednesday they would update. We sold this many. Uh, one of the last Tuesday nights this year was a double header. So they are like, we're going to run out of hot dogs. But yeah, just the, you know, the, ba the basic hot dogs. Yeah, that's not a bad pick at all. Yeah, either um, at the game or the street meet outside, which is, you know, always a good go-to. Yeah, no doubt about it. And uh, I guess finishing off here, a few more things. Uh, you know, Toronto, they made it to the postseason this season. You know, they ended up losing to Seattle. It was a heartbreaking loss, I know, for you. What do you envision for them next year? Are they going to still be com competing for a play? They have a, a nice young nucleus. What are you expecting out of the Blue Jays next season? I think they're going to be there for a few years, you know, yeah. having players like Vlad, Bobachet, George Springer still under contract for a few more years, Alec Manoa, you know, the kids of stud, and, you know, Kevin Gosman, as all Giants fans know how he <laughs> is. But, you know, that that's a nice two, one-two punch. I, I have a feeling there might be some trades coming along because they have, like, a lot of depth at catcher specifically. Their number one prospect is a catcher. They have two guys in Alejandro Kirk and uh, Danny Jansen, who could be starting on a lot of teams. So I expect one or two of those players to be traded. Um, I expect some pitching additions, you know, because they did struggle. You know, they depended on, you know, Yusei Kikuchi, um, White. I can't even remember his first name. He was so bad this year. I tried to forget him. They got him from the Dodgers. What, ha what uh, happened to Jose Barrios? Like he was supposed <laughs> to be good. What happened he, to him? He he was a he was an anomaly this year. Like in his games, he was good. He was good. His ERA was over five. His problem was he had like four or five, maybe even more starts this year that he gave up like seven runs. Mm. So that inflated the ERA. But like you know, he still got the case. You know, but he, he could be their number three starter this next next year. It's probably going to be Manoa, Gossman, Berrios, unless they sign somebody. I, I'm, I'm kind of predicting who will push everybody else back. Oh, I think I know. Is, it, is his initials JD? No, actually, you're close. It's JV. Oh, okay. Okay. So is that going to be on a, on a short-term deal? He's up there in age. I think so. I, well, because I, I keep reading last year, the Jays were very, very close to signing Verlander. So I have a feeling they explore that again this year, like they did last year with Gossman, because, you know, in 2021, they were close to signing Gossman and he decided to accept the qualifier offers from the Giants. Mm -hmm. Season ends. What is, what's the first thing the Blue Jays do? Sign Gosman. Gosman. So I, I would not be surprised if they turn around and try the same thing this year with Verlander. Not only do you have the number one at the top, 
but then you have somebody to teach Alec Manoa, who Manoa's already made no secret. That's who he looks up to. Yeah, absolutely. And and the thing about one to learn from. Yeah, a hundred percent. And the thing about Verlander is that, you know, you could get him on a one, probably going to take a two year deal. Uh, That's probably ideal. But every team should be interested in a guy like that. You know, it's not a big commitment. I mean, the AAV might be pretty high, but I mean, what's what's not to like? You just get another arm in your rotation, and it's not a seven year deal. I mean, that's like perfect for a starting pitcher. And he just had Tommy John. Um, his elbow is new ish with the, the new ligament in there. So we shall see. What about the giants, Chris, any, anything about uh, the giants this off season, where do you expect to see their roster? I guess on opening day. I am very curious with all these reports coming out, you know, <laughs> from New York about Aaron judge, like, you know, I, I can't help but get a little excited, but at the same time, a little pessimistic because, you know, the last few years we've heard this player is going to sign here because he's close to home. You know, when the Jays signed George Springer two years ago, I kept reading Boston because George Springer is from Connecticut. It's close to home. It's close to home. It's close to home. Well, now we're hearing the same thing with Judge. You know, he grew up a Giants fan. That's no secret. Any interviews you see with him, he has a signed Buster Posey jersey behind him. So, you know, like, I, I'm trying to I'm trying to curb my excitement, but it's not. It's, it's very hard not to get a little bit excited about the thought of him, you know, in the middle of that lineup come opening day in New York. That's right. Opening day at Yankee stadium. Yeah. And uh, the one thing that I should clear up about judge and that the, the national baseball scene needs to understand, he's not from the Bay area. Cause I've, as somebody was trying to argue this on my timeline or on my, in my mentions, they're like, yeah, Aaron judge from the Bay area. He's close. Like he is close. He is, but it's not the Bay area. He's from uh a little bit more near the Stockton area. It's it's up. It's it's just outside the Bay Area. I know Bay Area people are getting upset about that, but no, you're right. He is local. I I'm now, I'm now a you know condescending myself here. Um. So, but I mean, yeah, no, he'd be a, an interesting fit too, and I I want to see how his market plays out for sure. Um. And finally, before we wrap up, we mentioned the other sports at the beginning of the at the beginning of the segment. What makes baseball different from the other sports in your mind? Why is it something that sticks out and is kind of like, you know, really cool in a sense to where it's, it's a, it's a game that, that is very poetic. Do you feel that way too? A little bit. I I think it's the whole wait and see thing with baseball, you know, like basketball, it's go, 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 go. Anything can happen at any second hockey, same thing. But I think it's just the tense and the stress of waiting for that pitch. You know, like the 2012 at bat with Sergio Romo and uh, Jay Bruce. Like that, that, the perfect example, right? Like you're sitting there stressing what, as Romo's about to throw the ball. Is Bruce going to hit it out and take the lead? You know, like you don't get that with the other sports. You know, I don't, I don't find the intensity and the stress as high, you know, high level. Because of that waiting for each pitch, each at bat, you know, looking at the lineup, see who's coming up, you know, hockey, basketball, football, you don't really have that. You know, I think that's what makes me love baseball so much is the mental part of the fandom. Yeah, no doubt about it. And if if Bruce were to do something there, I think Bruce Bochy would have taken a lot of heat for having Romo face him. And and if you look at the uh, what happened this postseason with uh, Suarez against Bryce Harper, Bob Melvin got destroyed for letting Suarez face Suarez, a right-handed pitcher face Harper, the left-handed batter uh, and Harper ended up hitting the home run of his life in the Phillies advance to the world series. So yeah, no good stuff, Chris, this was awesome. And I really appreciate you, uh, you coming on to talk kind of about your baseball story. I think I, I really enjoyed it for sure. It was fun about time. I'm glad I was finally able to find a couple of minutes to do this. Yes, you are. You are now a friend of the show, Chris Corbett. You're 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 a friend of the show. Uh, everybody who's come on RizzoCast is a friend of the show, and uh, I'll definitely have you on again for sure at some point. For sure, sounds good. All right, on to the next. All right, welcome back. We are back with Catherine Galanti from Los Angeles, California, where the sun seemingly is always shining. And uh, she joins Rizzo Cast here on Why I Love the Game. How are you doing, Catherine? Welcome. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm super stoked to get started. 
yeah, no, this should be a lot of fun. And, and basically, uh, as I mentioned off air, we usually get into, you know, baseball fans and, and how they kind of got into the game. And it's usually a fun segment. It's been well received. A lot of people have listened and said that they they really like the segment. So I can't wait to get uh, going here. Uh, first and foremost, I mean, Los Angeles, usually when we think Los Angeles, we think the Dodgers. Uh, I mean, there's the Anaheim market there too, where it is kind of, I think I know this cause I know you, but where does the allegiance hold for, uh, for you? The allegiance is 100% angels all the way. Um, I I've kind of prided myself on being a big time Dodgers hater, which I think should earn me some points with your yeah. listeners here. Um, but yeah, actually just kind of a funny story. My dad is from Indianapolis. My mom is from LA. And so when my dad moved out to LA, uh, both my parents are big baseball fans, but my dad moved out. He's like, oh, I, I live in LA now. Guess I'll support the Dodgers. And as my sister and I were growing up, eventually to my mom was like, hey, you know what? We're not doing this. We're not bringing our small children to Dodger Stadium anymore. Uh, you're going to be an Angels fan from now on. And so that's really where it started for me. Um, some of my earliest memories are being like, a couple years old and watching Vlad Guerrero Sr. just absolutely crush home runs. Um, so that's really where baseball, um, my baseball story started from here. And I'm, I'm glad that it's been such a big part of my life from then. So Dodger stick, cause from a Giants fan perspective, like Dodger stadium does have that like aspect to it where it does seem like a little violent and a little too much. Is that the same down there? Like do non Dodger fans genuinely fear Dodger stadium? Yeah, I think that that's still <laughs> the big impression for me personally. I just hate the stadium. Um, it is so hard to navigate. Like the cantilevered design is kind of cool. I like that it's built into the hill, but walking around inside the stadium is just such a terrible user experience, fan experience that, you know, I, I have a lot of dislike for the team itself but as a stadium you can call it a piece of history that's not my my view yeah i mean it's very like it's i it, i think it's a nice stadium but like it doesn't have any signature like thing about it and i guess that leads me into this next question is angel stadium i mean what is there to like about angel stadium give me like an honest review of what you think about uh, the ballpark in, in Anaheim. I will be honest. I'm a big fan of Angel Stadium. It is probably not my number one stadium that I've been to, but it's definitely up there. I really like the Angel Stadium. You can walk all the way around the field on one concourse, where I think that you don't really get that experience in many other stadiums. And it's also held up surprisingly well for as old as it is. Angel Stadium is almost as old as Dodger Stadium. I think it was built in 62. Don't quote me on that. But I think that it holds up surprisingly well for as old as it is. It's still um, maybe a smaller ballpark than a lot of other newer stadiums, but it is still very nice. I personally am a big fan of the fountain in the outfield. I really like that feature a lot, but it just it feels very homey to me. And actually, I, I prefer college baseball over MLB baseball. I might be an outlier on that opinion, but being an angel stadium feels to me more like being in a college ballpark. And so I really like that kind of cozier homey atmosphere that you get there. And uh, I know you're a college student right now. How often do you get a chance to kind of like be around college baseball? As much as I can, but not as much as I want to. Um, I'm a big fan of Loyola Marymount University's baseball team. That's where I'm a student here now. And I've been following that team longer than I've been a student, uh, I think seven or eight years now. It's hard to keep track at this point. Um, I'm a big fan of their program. It's really cool to see how the program has changed over the years, kind of the guys who have played and graduated or gone on to pro careers. Um, shout out to David Fletcher of the Angels. Got, got to rep that um, school pride and, and hometown pride as well. But yeah, I'm a big college baseball fan. I'll watch anything, really whatever's on, whatever I can uh, go to a game, watch online. I'm all over it. 
So David Fletcher, I did not know he went there. That's interesting. Yeah, he's currently the most successful product of Loyola Marymount baseball. We're very proud. Uh, he was a sixth round pick in 2015, star shortstop here, and has had a pretty decent career with the Angels so far. Um, it's always kind of interesting um, going to the stadium and like seeing his face like on the outside of the building and knowing that if I really wanted to, I could call him. <laughs> I've interviewed him before. Like I have his number. I would never abuse that privilege. Um, I take journalistic integrity very seriously, but it is very interesting being like, hey, I know that guy. Yeah, hundred, and he's fun to watch too. He, you know, he uses the whole field when he hits. He's kind of like that throwback ball player. And speaking of uh, players, the Angels have that are pretty good. I know that they have maybe a few of them. Uh, just a couple. Just, yeah, just a couple guys that just uh, kind of are generational talent. Uh, let's start with Mike Trout because he's been there for like ten years now, and he's just been. I mean, he's been the best when he's healthy. He's the best player in baseball, hands down. He's going to the Hall of Fame if he retired tomorrow. What's it just been like kind of watching Mike Trout day in and day out, you know, hit home runs and climb fences and steal bases? I'm sure that's probably a treat for you. Absolutely. I will say, I think I took it for granted a lot when I was growing up. You know, he has been in the major leagues for most of my baseball watching life. And I think when you're a kid, you, you understand some of it. And you, you're like, hey, that's pretty cool. He hit a home run. He hit another home run. He made a great catch, anything like that. But now that I'm older and I'm more into sports and like how sports work and, and all of the background of it, it's really starting to sink in just how unusual it is to see someone like that day in and day out for what, close to a decade now. And so it, it definitely does pain me to see him every season, like, oh, Mike Trout is hurt again. Mm -hmm. But in my mind, that does not diminish how much of a privilege and an honor it really is to see him play as much as I have. And it's weird, like every year it's like, oh, Mike Trout, you know, tore his thumb sliding in the second base. And then you look and he's got like a seven win year. It's like, what happened? Mike Trout just putting up these numbers still after missing like a few months there. Um, and speaking of kind of like unusual Shohei Otani, when he first broke into the league, we had never seen a batter and a pitcher and the Babe Ruth comparisons in my mind, like they're, they're fine, but Ruth, like did them both hit and pitch like once in his career. And like, that's the comparison that I feel like, yeah, just because that's the last notable one that did it. But Otani, I think what he's doing is way more impressive. Um, so just you know, watching him and win MVP and just pitch and then the next night hit a home run or maybe do it on the same night. I'm sure that's probably awesome too. It definitely is awesome. Shohei Otani, for me, it is so cool to watch him improve year after year and, you know, still kind of keep pushing the boundaries of what's possible. <laughs> As a two-way player, I remember when he first came up, he wasn't pitching and hitting together all the time it would be like oh if he was pitching you know he wouldn't be in the lineup or if he was hitting you know th there was like kind of some offsetting and seeing him grow and take on like a more active role in the lineup has just been so cool and see that it's really possible to balance those two things and to do it as well as he is it's not like oh, he's a, a decent pitcher and, you know, a kind of mediocre hitter or, you know, he can hit home runs, but he's only averaging like 74 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. Like the fact that he is so elite on both aspects of baseball just really goes to show. I've always been like a big proponent that athletes are probably, or sorry, baseball players are probably the best all around athletes of any sport. I think that there are some sports that are physically tougher like hockey is more maybe physically demanding but baseball players if you're a good baseball player you can be successful in any sport and I think that no baseball player really demonstrates that as much as Shohei Otani does and it was such a surprise actually to me when he first signed with the Angels I was 100% 100% convinced he was going to Seattle I was like oh it's it's a done deal 
Um, so to see that talent for my childhood team has just been so incredible. And I definitely don't think that I'm going to make the same mistake of taking Otani for granted the way that I did for Trout earlier on in my life. Yeah, it's well said. He's fast too. He's really fast. He's so fast. Didn't he have like the highest sprint speed on the Angels or something like that? Crazy. Something like that. And he's a big guy too. Like he's a big guy and a pitcher, which historically don't add up to speed. Mm -hmm. um, but that's just one other thing that you can list on Shohei Otani's accomplishments. The list is very long, but that's one other bullet point on it. Yeah, he's my favorite Otani. Um, I guess it's not really uh uh, an Otani anecdote as it, as it is much of his, you know, well, let me rephrase that. Cause I can't talk right now. Um, uh, my favorite Otani, I think it does. It is an Otani anecdote, but his trainer, didn't his trainer like resign during the lockout just so he could talk to Shoei Otani and then was rehired by the angels once the lockout ended. Cause I know that you can't talk if you're working for an organization, you can't talk to anybody on the player side. Did you hear anything about that? No, that's news to me. That's fascinating, though. I had no idea. Yeah, so I I don't know. I gotta recheck re that. I don't want to be spreading uh, misinformation on on this podcast. But uh, yeah, no, I had to I had to ask you about those two guys and Trout and Otani. They're definitely a big um, big part of the Angels and even the national view of the Angels. Um, now, I guess the uh, the the big picture with the Angels, like what needs to be done? I know the team is like for sale or like they're looking for offers to sell and they've had big free agents in the past with Anthony Rendon. And like from the national point of view, I feel like everybody in baseball is saying, why doesn't this team ever invest in starting pitching? You know, you know, they always get the Matt Harvey's and the Noah Cinder guards and like those random arms and the Jose can, I don't know if Quintana was ever an angel. Was he? And then, um, I would have to double check that. Yeah, but they 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 always get like the same type of like mid to back end Dylan Bundy. I mean, it's always the same names. So what needs to be done in Anaheim for them to be competitive in the, the American League West? Yeah, so I have long uh, pretended to be kind of a backseat GM, and yes. several winning fantasy <laughs> seasons do uh, hopefully back me up on this. But I think the biggest thing for the Angels is, first of all, stop spending stupid money on guys who are former big names and aren't really playing at their prime anymore. Like you look at, you just named a ton of pitchers, but you look at um, like even Albert Pujols, you look at Anthony Rendon, you look at um, who his name Optin. escapes me right now. Huh? Justin Upton, even Justin too. Upton, yeah. um, Josh Hamilton. You look at <laughs> all these guys that were very good at one point in their career. And by the time they get to the angels objectively are no longer at that point in their career, but are still getting paid like that. Um, I think that's one of the biggest issues that the angels have had historically mm -hmm. that, um, you're, you're paying really big money for former stars who aren't producing anymore. And that money is being taken out of, say, minor league development. Like the Angels farm system has been ranked very low for <laughs> many, many years. And I think if we focused more on homegrown talent, you know, building up some pitchers, building up like some depth for like, the long term, not just the short term, maybe eventually we would be able to see some success. Mike Trout has played in one playoff game his mm -hmm. whole career. Um, and if you're if you're putting out that kind of money, if you're signing those kind of names, eventually you have to produce results. And so far that hasn't happened for the Angels. Um, the other thing too is the AL West is a good division. Oof. I think that it's a better division than many other people give it credit for, but you look at just the Astros alone. Um, I, I do have to say in full transparency, uh, I'm also an Astros fan. And so I, I do support what the Astros um, have done recently. I think that they've done a really good job um, balancing signing and like homegrown talent. But you look at other teams, even like Seattle is on the rise as well. Like 
the AL West is evolving and certainly some teams haven't quite caught up to that evolution. You look at, you know, the Oakland A's, you look at the Rangers. I don't think that those teams are quite at that level yet. Um, but if the Angels would like to keep up with what's happening in the division, something has to change. And so hopefully, hopefully they take my advice. I think that I'm onto something here, but it really is painful to watch them keep making the same mistakes year after year. So will you apply for a spot in the organization? Because I feel like you could be a GM right now. You know what? Um, management has never been the most appealing mm -hmm. aspect of working in sports, but you never know. It could happen maybe a few years from now. Yeah, well, you could just make the acquisitions and then you could have someone else like manage, you know, everything else. <laughs> so there you maybe, go. Maybe I'll look into it. Maybe, maybe the front office is where I belong. Maybe and a fantasy football win, did you say, or a few? I I will say I am much better at fantasy baseball than fantasy. Oh, fantasy football. baseball, yeah. Yeah, fantasy baseball. Um, I was the defending champ this season. Um, lost in the finals. Uh, this year, really disappointing. I was up by over a hundred points on the second to last day of the season. Oh. Somehow blew it. Still not sure what happened. Uh, but fantasy baseball, I can hold my own. Fantasy football. Um, I have a couple of teams going right now I think two are maybe five and two or four and three one is zero and seven so I cannot claim as much fantasy football knowledge as fantasy baseball <laughs> still something though still something. It's still something yeah and just to pivot here uh real quick uh I know that you're trying to get into sports journalism student journalism there um student journalists there uh, is covering baseball like the goal? Is that is that the goal for you? Like, if I were to ask a dream job, and I think I asked, and you know Alex Hudden, who of course was on the last edition, I think I asked him what his dream job was. So I'm going to ask you the same question: In baseball, what would be your dream job, or in sports journalism? I guess. Yeah, that is that's something that I've been thinking a lot about lately, especially as I'm applying for internships and you know trying to set things up post graduation. Um, Alex in particular, I really admire Alex. He did my job before I did my job. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm, I'm following in some pretty big footsteps there, but as far as dream jobs go, um, I personally am more interested in the writing side of sports media rather than the maybe on air analyst aspect. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, I don't know, or, uh, commentating too, like, play by play that is very intimidating to me I will be honest I would rather um, watch the game do my write-up afterwards but um, I'm not exactly sure what dream job would be I think that there are some places that I would love to work um, like the athletic to oh, me yeah. is kind of the pinnacle of sports writing and I think that I could learn a lot there so if that opportunity ever comes up I would jump on that in a heartbeat but um, I don't know. I think the kind of traditional uh, newspaper sports section is, I hesitate to say dying, but I will say evolving. And so if, if I end up in a newspaper, that's great. Um, I do really admire that traditional uh, sports writing kind of like gritty journalism in yeah. a sense. Um, but there are so many opportunities in sports media that I would love to explore. Um, and I think that there are a lot of things out there that I don't even realize yet that might be a great fit in the future as well. And it's funny you mentioned the athletic because I'm also a big fan of the athletic and, and I was like hesitant at first. I was like, God, it's subscription based journalism. And Ken Rosenthal's going over to this like random site startup journal. And then they started just poaching everybody all these big journalists and then they mixed them with like fresh you know asu guys and syracuse guys coming out of college and now they're beat writers and everything and i think the athletic does the best job of feature writing they have really good yes. feature writing really in-depth reporting like i don't know if you got to read they've done like a series of articles on zach granke where they interviewed folks about zach granke no i love those the, there's a like human interest has always been the most interesting part of sports for me. And especially in sports writing, I think that sports kind of act as a microcosm for mm -hmm. like the greater human experience. There are a lot of 
relationships and experiences that you get through sports that I think a lot of people are really quick to write off. Like I've kind of had this conversation where, oh, sports journalism isn't real journalism. Um, and part of that is like, okay, I enjoy my job. Like mm-hmm. that doesn't mean that I'm working uh, <laughs> any less exactly. than, than someone who's um, on a news desk or a metro desk, anything like that. Um, and so kind of changing that perception of sports journalism is really fascinating to me and finding those really human stories that I think The Athletic does so well. Um, I realized that I forgot to mention. Also, um, do you remember MLB Cut 4? Yes, of course. A very, very different style of writing than what's featured on The Athletic. But I think if I can find some kind of balance between like the emotional side that The Athletic draws on versus more of the funny entertaining side that was the staple of cut four um something along those lines would be the absolute dream and then there's also um i am more interested in the writing aspect than more like video production but you look at um like john boyce or secret base like what they're doing is so innovative and so inspiring mm-hmm. to me as well that i hope that in some way i can kind of incorporate all of those things that inspire me yeah and there, there's a big there's like a vast difference because i know a lot of people that a lot of writers that write very analytically driven pieces where it's like this guy's um spin rate is up from his last start and he's throwing his change up more and those pieces are so much different than you know other pieces where there's a lot more reporting involved in terms of the human interest like you mentioned and um the athletic does that really well i think you could be like the uh the cousin for like the the Cespedes barbecue brothers or whatever. Oh, I right? love Cespedes barbecue. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I would, I'd totally be down for that. I think that that would be great. Um, I was going to say something else and I completely forgot it. Um, All right, Catherine. Well, before we head out, we have, I have some rapid fire for you. Uh, not trying to be like MLB networks, intentional talk or anything, but I kind of like as much as I want to do that. Uh, I kind of have my own thing here. So I'm going to give you three questions and this doesn't even have to be rapid fire. Um, You could just answer, you know, whatever. First things first, do you have a favorite baseball movie? I do have a favorite baseball movie. I think I could give you the standard answers, Sandlot. I think Little Big League is underrated, but that's a different conversation. But overall, I'm going to go with everybody wants some kind of an unconventional pick. I don't think that the baseball action is the best that's ever been shown, but I do think that the depiction of baseball players, just, you know, a real like Mm -hmm. boys will be boys movie. I think that the depiction of baseball players just in their natural environment is one of the best, most natural uh, images images isn't the right word um but i think that it does a really good job with that i haven't seen that one so i'm gonna have to check that one out so that, that's an interesting one uh everybody what's it called everybody everybody wants some everybody wants them so you heard it here first go check that out it's one of Catherine's favorite movies all right baseball, i won't steer you wrong yes baseball food what comes to mind Ooh, i'm gotta keep it simple i'm just going sunflower seeds um what part flavor of that is oh that all right now it gets a little bit tricky i'm a big dill pickle fan i think you can't go wrong with cracked pepper um and i think ranch is always a classic those are my top three what about barbecue barbecue is pretty good for me like barbecue sunflower seeds aren't quite a top three mm-hmm. um but they're probably a top five there you go. Yeah. I, I feel like the barbecue, any sunflower seeds is going to like make you like thirsty and needing to drink water of some sort, but barbecue sunflower seeds that takes it to a whole different level. So good answers though. I like uh, sunflower seeds, of course. Um, what about, so this one's specialized for you. Do you have okay. a favorite baseball journalist or favorite baseball reporter uh, or TV person or somebody in the media? Yeah, uh, there are so many people that I admire and look up to. As far as baseball specific journalists, I got to go with Chandler Rome. He's the Astros beat writer uh, for the Houston Chronicle. Love his work. I think that really goes back to 
what I was talking about more with the athletic and really that kind of emotional, like the writing just grabs you. And I think baseball is the perfect vehicle for that type of writing. And so I really, really admire his work. Yeah. And he's on, he's a contributor on MLB network quite a bit. And it's funny when the, uh, I was in the press conference. It was late at night when the Giants, um, Pete Patilla, the, their new GM, who was the assistant GM in Houston, Chandler was in the Zoom call and it was like, it was like 10 o'clock Pacific time. So it must have been like 1 a.m. there, right? Is that right? And then um, I don't think Houston is Eastern, but I'm all right, sorry, sure Central Houston time. So it was like midnight me. there and he was on the Zoom call. So um that's dedication dedication pure dedication for uh for Chandler yeah no he does really good stuff there uh and last but not least pick from the buffet here favorite baseball moment hmm there are so many to choose from um I think for me personally it's got to be witnessing a perfect game in person at Loyola Marymount University. Uh, It was Corey Abbott versus BYU in, I don't remember the exact date, but I know it was the 2018 season. And so just being there, I didn't realize until maybe like the fifth inning. (laughs) Um, And you're watching like all these zeros just go up on the board. And LMU actually still does have a manual scoreboard. And so it was very cool to see like someone like put up a physical zero on the board. And I, of course, I couldn't say anything, couldn't say anything. I was sitting with my family. I couldn't even like look at them and be like, hey, check this out. Look how many hits haven't been hit. (laughs) Um, And the end of the game, I finally, I'm sitting on the edge of my seat, final out gets recorded. And I'm jumping up and down. I'm out of my seat. I'm like, oh my God, he did it. It's a perfect game. It's a perfect game. And the the BYU fans sitting behind me are like, no, what are you talking about? He walked a guy. And I was like, no, he didn't. You don't know what you're talking about. It's a perfect game. And, you know, over the PA, you hear, congratulations, Corey Abbott, perfect game. And so that really just stands out in my memory as like the coolest baseball moments i know you've witnessed a no hitter um at the mlb level uh so far i haven't been that lucky but still seeing a perfect game at any level is really really cool yeah i was like in sixth grade when i saw lincecum's like second no hitter i think and i'm just like like a mega lincecum fan who is and it? yeah and, and he was awesome and and i like you i didn't even know until the fifth inning uh and that's like so when you're when you don't have twitter and you don't have like the broadcasters like talking, it's difficult. Like that's probably when the average time is when people realize. So I guess that's funny. It's the worst when I get like the MLB, like at bat notifications and it's like Mm -hmm. breaking no hitter in the seventh inning. Like, why would you tell me that? Why would you, why would you send that notification to everyone? I, Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think I, I think baseball superstitions have something to them. I do believe in them. Yeah, no, I, I do too. I think there are baseball gods too. So I think, I think if you, uh, if you mess with the baseball gods, they will mess with you back. And I think if you're good to the baseball uh, gods, they will reward you. So, um, oh, it says my internet Absolutely. connection is unstable again. Fun. Uh, but anyways, oh, Catherine, no. this was awesome. Uh, I really appreciate you, uh, you coming on and kind of telling your baseball story. It was a blast. We're kind of cutting out there, but thank you again for having me. I think I caught the question. Yeah. It was such a pleasure to be here. Um, and it's it's always so much fun just to talk baseball. Yeah, 100%. And uh, where can we find you? Are, you? are you on Twitter? Do you want to like plug yourself? Yeah, sure. I never really get the opportunity to. You can find me on Twitter at Galanti Catherine. That's G A L A N T I C A T H E R I N. Somehow my full name was already taken, even though I've never met another Catherine Galanti. So it's just C A T H E R I N on Twitter. And you can also find me at uh, laloyolan.com. I'm the sports editor there. Awesome. And uh, future press box star so i hope so keep that in mind with the covering the angels of course she'll be like the david fletcher of like the press box like hometown kid just covering her favorite team so 
Uh, anyways, and then you guys could follow the podcast on Twitter and Instagram at RizzoCast, um, Apple, Spotify, wherever you find your podcast. We are on YouTube, all that fun stuff. So go check that out and see you next time.